Hi, I'm Tim Madigan, the director of the St. John Fisher College Irish Studies Program. Our guest today on our community forum is Professor Christine Keneally, a highly regarded writer and lecturer. She earned her PhD from Trinity College Dublin, writing on the introduction of the poor law in Ireland. Keneally has written extensively about the Great Famine and its impact, most notably in her book, This Great Calamity, The Irish Famine, 1845 to 52 and she's spoken in both the U.S. Congress and the British Parliament on the famine. Since September 2007, she's been a tenured professor at Drew University's Casperson Graduate School in Madison, New Jersey. She's written over 16 books on Irish and Irish-American history and numerous scholarly articles. Her book, War and Peace, Ireland Since the 1960s, came out recently, and her most recent book, Daniel O'Connell and the Anti-Slavery Movement, The Saddest People the Sun Sees, examines Daniel O'Connell's contribution to the American anti-slavery movement. In it, she addresses the impact which O'Connell had on Frederick Douglass. Welcome, Professor Kinnealy. Thank you. Now, I thought we'd begin by talking a little bit about uh, yourself. I guess you were born in Liverpool. Yes, um, I was born, my family were Irish, I grew up in an Irish community in Liverpool and if you don't know Liverpool, it's in the north of England, it's a seaport and it's the place where many Irish emigrants first went to sell to North America. So it's a very Irish city, uh, interesting city, city full of music, full of culture. Most people associate it with the Beatles yes. for good reasons. Um, so it's a, it's a very exciting place to grow up. It has a direct ferry to this day to Ireland. So again, those connections, those sea connections, historical connections remain very strong. Mm -hmm. And when did you first go to Ireland? I didn't go till I was an adult, so I grew up knowing about my Irish heritage. In fact, we sort of felt we were part of Ireland. We felt very integrated. The joke is Liverpool is Ireland's 33rd county, or <laughs> some people say it's Dublin's overspill. So we felt that Irish connection. But growing up Irish in Britain is very different, I think, from growing up Irish in America in the 20th century, because we really hid our Irishness in many ways. We were still very, very looked down on. We weren't integrated. And then as I got you know, towards my teenage years, of course, the troubles in Northern Ireland, the bombing campaign by the IRA in England. So being Irish in Britain was really not an easy thing to be. Mm. So it was a very, very different experience. Um, there was no, despite Liverpool being such an Irish city, St. Patrick's Day wasn't celebrated. And there were attempts to celebrate it in 2000. And the Orange Order, who were very Protestant, anti-Catholic, organization came out and deliberately disrupted it. So it wasn't until 2002 that the first modern St. Patrick's Day parade was held in Liverpool, which I think sort of sums up how problematic, difficult it was being Irish in Britain. Now your parents were both born in Ireland? My parents were Irish. My mother's family were from Mayo. My dad's family were from Tipperary. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And then you went to uh, the University uh, Trinity College in Dublin? Yeah, so sort of the awakening I think came, you know, I always felt Irish and we secretly observed St. Patrick's Day, etc. <laughs> but th I think my awakening came when I read um, Sean O'Casey's plays and his trilogy and I was very moved by what he wrote about the Irish working classes. He briefly refers to the famine but at that point I knew I wanted to study Irish history and at that point and even to this point you know, there was very little Irish history being taught in Britain despite the, you know, the incredible role Irish people Ireland has played in British history. So but at that point I knew I had to somehow sometime get to Ireland so I eventually got to Trinity College in Dublin. Well, I want to uh, return in a moment to your work on the famine, but I thought we could talk a little bit about Daniel O'Connell, because you've done a lot of work on, on, on O'Connell and his importance in Irish history. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how much most Irish Americans or Americans in general are aware of him and why he is such an important figure. 
Yeah. So O'Connell, he was Catholic. He was born in, born in County Kerry, the West Coast of Ireland, in 1775. His family were quite poor, but he had a wealthy, if eccentric, uncle who provided for Daniel to have a good education. But because he was a Catholic, there was only one university in Ireland. It was only open to Protestants. So he and his brother were edu educated in France. He happened to be in France at the time of the French Revolution, 1789. He came back to Ireland to study law. He was in Ireland at the time of an uprising in Ireland, 1798. But these two events, these two uprisings, gave him an abhorrence of violence for political ends. So throughout his life, he was a constitutionalist. He refused to use physical force or to promote physical force. Mm -hmm. So he became a very brilliant lawyer very quickly, the best known lawyer in Ireland. But he used his knowledge of the law to actually challenge the British government, because Ireland at that stage was a British colony, to challenge the government and to, to demand equal rights for Catholics. And he achieved this in 1829. Catholics got the right to sit in the British Parliament. And because of this, he became known as the Liberator. And his fame, it wasn't just in Ireland, it wasn't just in Britain, it was throughout Europe. And in fact, it was within America. When it was heard in America that he got Catholic emancipation, the Liberty Bell was rang in Philadelphia. So he was somebody who really had an international reputation. Um, of course, the British government really despised him and they drew various caricatures of him to suggest he was violent, he was stupid, but in fact he was probably the greatest statesman of his era, both in Ireland and in Britain. When he died in 1847, the Pope in Rome did something unprecedented and asked for three days of prayer on behalf of this layman, Daniel O'Connell. So there was a day of prayer in French, a day in Latin, and a day of prayer in England. So he was truly a man whose influence and impact extended beyond the island of Ireland. Well, of course, anyone who visits Dublin will know O'Connell Street and the okay. huge statue of him there. Yeah. So he's, so he's certainly uh, well known in, in Ireland uh, 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 till today. He is, yes. O'Connell Street, it was renamed um, in the 20th century. So O'Connell Street is the widest street in Ireland mm -hmm. and it is the heart of Dublin. And there's an enormous statue of O'Connell at the head of it. And so, yes, I mean, he's hard to ignore in some ways in terms of his presence in Dublin today. Now, his work uh, in Catholic emancipation, I think, as you said, is, was very important because up until that time, Catholics couldn't serve mm. in the Parliament, and I think there mm. were other uh, discriminate, discriminatory laws against them. Mm -hmm. So he played a, a huge role in that regard. But as from reading your work, I've learned that he saw this as part of a, a broader agenda, the emancipation mm. of all humanity. He did, and I think that's something that's less known about O'Connell, his campaign for what I see as human rights, social justice, mm -hmm. before the words were probably fashionable. Um, as soon as he won Catholic emancipation you know, for Catholics in Ireland, he started to campaign for Jewish emancipation because Jews within Britain, within Ireland, were similarly disbarred from sitting in the British Parliament, and he felt this was a great injustice, so he campaigned for that. He campaigned on behalf of Aborigines in Australia, Maoris in New Zealand, because he felt that their civilization had been wiped out by British colonization, so he campaigned on their behalf. But his great campaign, which to me is really his greatest achievement, but perhaps not as well known, was for the abolition of slavery. So he first was introduced to the abolition movement by a man from Liverpool, James Cropper, in 1824. And from 1824 till the end of his life, he campaigned exhaustively for the ending of slavery. Now, initially, his interest was slavery within the British Empire, and slavery was ended in the British Empire in 1833. And he was dis delighted it had been ended, but he was disgusted with the way it was brought about, because the slave owners were given £20 million compensation. He argued that money should go to the slaves. Also, slavery wasn't ended straight away, but there were various conditions so that slaves could get used to being free. And he argued this was an aberration, that slavery should be immediate and total. The other thing he did, which to us we perhaps take for granted now, but at the time it was very radical, he argued that black people were the equal of white people. Mm 
that slavery didn't need to be gradual, that slaves did not need to be educated into accepting their freedom, that these people were the equals of whites and therefore abolition should be immediate and total. So he was really very, you know, at the very radical end of the abolition movement. Well, I learned a lot about him through your work because uh, I knew a little bit about his work in Catholic emancipation, mm. but this was something uh, previously unknown to me. Mm. And I remember one of the things you write about is that when he would meet someone from the southern states, in particular of America, mm. he would ask where they stood on slavery. Absolutely. And this issue came to a head because um, O'Connell was a member of the British Parliament and because he was so well known, people wanted to meet him. And in 1839, the American ambassador, Andrew Stevenson, was in London and he asked to be introduced to O'Connell. And O'Connell posed this very question and O'Connell already knew that this was a man who owned slaves. And O'Connell accused him of being a slave breeder, which Stevenson didn't take to it very politely, and he challenged the quite old O'Connell at this stage to a duel. So O'Connell refused to fight the duel, but this debate between the two men was played out in the media. So the British newspapers, the Irish newspapers, the American newspapers. So in the north, the newspapers held by Garrison, of course, supported O'Connell. He was their champion. But newspapers in the southern states saw him as a blackguard, a rascal. How dare he insult an American president, except, sorry, an American ambassador. And it was actually debated in Congress. So again, you know, O'Connell's role really ignited public opinion and contributed to public debate. But the other thing it did was some years later, when Frederick Douglass came to Ireland, he said he had heard of this debate and that his master lambasted O'Connell. And Douglass responded to, the, to this by saying, I knew if my master hated him, I would love him. Well, that leads me to my next question, because uh, another thing I learned from your work was that Frederick Douglass, who of course lived here in Rochester for many years and is buried here, came to Ireland in 1845, uh, was a very young man at the mm. time, and had the chance to meet Daniel O'Connell. He did, and there's some mythology and some confusion about their meeting. But um, Douglas had escaped from slavery when he was 20 years old. He initially went to New Bedford, where he thought he'd be safe. He started to lecture. He was so brilliant that he was persuaded by William Garrison to actually become a professional lecturer on behalf of abolition. He decided to write his life story, his memoirs, the narrative, and because it got, again, so much attention, there was a danger he would be recaptured and taken back into slavery, as was the law at the time. So he was persuaded by his supporters to get out of America and to go to Britain and to Ireland. So he went in 1845, and also he hoped to produce a new edition of his narrative. That was to be published in, in Ireland. So he landed in Liverpool. He stayed in Liverpool for a few hours and then he sailed to Ireland. And he arrived the end of August 1845. And he was excited for a number of reasons. One, because he had heard that Irish abolitionists were very, very devoted, very ardent. So he was very excited to be part of that. And two, because he hoped he might get to meet the great Daniel O'Connell, of whom he'd heard so much. So he came to Ireland, he was very welcomed in Ireland, and he wrote a number of letters very movingly about his experience. He was in Ireland for four months, but he said that for Ireland, for him, Ireland was a transformative experience because for the first time in his life, he felt he was a man and not property. So for him, Ireland really changed him. And for me, having you know, reading his letters, you see, oh, Douglas found his voice in Ireland. He really did find himself. So I think it's a very important period in his life. So again, he went on the lecture circuit. He republished his narrative. He wrote his own introduction. So you know, very, very significant, all the things he did. But he'd been down to Cork. He came back to Dublin. And he heard that O'Connell was back in town. At this stage, O'Connell was 72 and really starting to be a bit ill but O'Connell was having one of his big meetings in Dublin and Douglas decided to go and he got there and the, the hall was overflowing and Douglas writes he didn't even think he'd get in but people saw him and they made way for him so eventually he got to the front and he was introduced to Daniel O'Connell's son 
and O'Connell's son said, you, know, you must meet my father. So he got to meet the great Daniel O'Connell. And Douglas was invited, the meeting was almost at an end, but Douglas was invited to get on stage and say a few words. Again, he says he was unprepared, but he said few words, he was very well received. But to me, what's really significant significant about him being there is when he's on stage, he praises O'Connell, as you can imagine. But what he says is, what we need in America is a black O'Connell. And to me, that's what Douglas became, mm -hmm. the black O'Connell of American abolition. Well, it's interesting, too, as you mentioned, O'Connell was such a strong advocate of nonviolence. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, of course, Martin Luther King mm -hmm. uh, served a very similar role here mm -hmm. in the 1960s and yeah. the 1950s in mm -hmm. his work in civil rights. Yeah. So I, I presume he was familiar with O'Connell. I, I think there's a real link. I mean, I think in other ways, because again, when Douglas leaves Ireland, he writes a letter to William Garrison, and he's very reflective of his time in Ireland. But what is clear is, he says, I started off just believing in a single issue, which was abolition. But I now see that the struggle of my people is the struggle of all people. So again, he becomes a human rights activist, I think because of his time in Ireland, and that's very important. So I think the O'Connell, the pacifism, which you can see the link to another Irish nationalist, Michael Davitt. Michael Davitt in turn influenced Gandhi in India, and Gandhi in turn influenced JFK. So I think there is that line of connection between all these great people, these great human rights activists. Well, in addition, uh President Obama went to Ireland a few years ago, and I know you had some connection with that. <laughs> um, yes, he was going to Ireland, and you know, very famously he went to find his Obama ancestor, mm -hmm. and you know, the joke was, I've come to find the apostrophe <laughs> between the O and the B in <laughs> Obama, and a number of songs are written about his visit. But if you watch it, you, it's very clear he's very happy to be in Ireland, and they took him to the place where his great-great-grandfather came from, Moneygall, a very tiny, small town in Ireland. But then Obama came into the centre of Dublin, and he spoke in the open air to masses of people who clearly felt very engaged with this young American president. He spoke about the connection between O'Connell and Douglas mm -hmm. and how moving he felt it because, as you know, he looks to Douglas and is very inspired by what Douglas did. And as I recall, uh, your own work was referenced. Uh Before um, the president went to Ireland, he had received a copy of my book on Daniel O'Connell and slavery, and he wrote to me thanking me for it. So uh, it's it's it was a nice acknowledgement. Yes. But you know, the, um, other people I'm sure influenced <laughs> him. But it was a nice acknowledgement. Well, I would say you're best known for your work on the Great Famine, mm -hmm. and here at St. John Fisher College, we have a monument to the victims of the Great Famine, and we just had an event yesterday at which you spoke uh, commemorating the victims and also trying to get a sense of the mm -hmm. history of that awful period. Mm -hmm. And of course, coincidentally, Frederick Douglass happened to be in Ireland in 1845 when yeah. the famine uh, essentially began. Yeah, so Douglass was there you know, the very end of August, early September 1845, and that's when this you know, terrible disease, um, this fungus, appeared and destroyed some of the potato crop in Ireland. Now this is 1845, so it's the first year of famine, but at that stage there was no mortality. And the real shortages arising from this appearance of blight weren't felt till the spring of 1846. So he really wouldn't have witnessed the famine. Mm -hmm. But what he did write about was the poverty of the Irish people. And he was very shocked to find how poor they were. And he drew analogies between the poverty of the Irish and the poverty of the slaves. But he drew one important distinction, that yes, they were poor, but they were free. And so there were similarities, but there was one, one major difference. But some of my research, my more current research, is on private donations to Ireland during the famine. And just one I've come across, which to me was very meaningful, was a committee was formed outside Philadelphia in 1847 to send money to Ireland. This is when the famine was really, really bad. And it was composed of free black men in Philadelphia. Mm 
and I have the minutes, and they decided they would send their money to Frederick Douglass, who was still touring the United Kingdom, wow. so that he could distribute it in Ireland. So there is that connection remains. And to me, it's very moving because people who themselves have been marginalised and badly treated were reaching out to another people who were suffering. So it's a very moving, moving story. And you mentioned uh, uh, yesterday that uh, Native Americans uh, uh, also donated. Uh, the story of people who gave to Ireland during the famine is just an incredible story. Um, and some of the rich and the, the good and you know, society gave. So Queen Victoria gave very controversially. The Sultan of Turkey gave. President of the United States gave. The Pope gave. So these people who were wealthy and in positions of power gave. So that's part of the story. And it's very interesting. But to me, the real wonderful part of this narrative is people who, as I say, were themselves disenfranchised, marginalised, looked down on, who didn't have much money, yet they contributed to Ireland. And you know, One famous example is the Choctaw Indians who'd been dispossessed of their lands in 1832, forced to go to Oklahoma on the Trail of Tears. So many of their people had died. Yet in 1847, they heard about the famine in Ireland and they sent $174. So you know, their contribution in real terms, I think, is truly, truly magnificent. And, and you mentioned, too, a, a young congressman from Illinois was one of the donors. That was one of my great discoveries, you know, that, the Frederick Douglass connection, but this was my other. I came across a young lawyer, recently elected politician from living in Illinois, who gave $10. And of course, it turns out to be Abraham Lincoln, who again has such associations with Frederick Douglass. Well, the famine, of course, is a huge topic, but it directly relates to uh, Irish studies, particularly Irish American studies, because so many of us living in the States, the fact that we're here is because our ancestors mm -hmm. came here to escape from the famine. Yeah, so there was um, emigration to America before the famine. In the 18th century, there'd been Protestant emigration to the Appalachian mountain area. But the most famous emigration, really, because it's so concentrated, comes in the famine period. Most of it comes between 1846, 1854, when over two million people out of a population of eight million people, so a quarter of the population, left Ireland forever essentially forever, and the great majority of those people came to America. But part of, I think, the sad sadness of the famine and the legacy of the famine is that emigration didn't stop in 1852 or 1854. It continued throughout the 19th century. So by 1900, there were more Irish-born people living in the States than living on the island of Ireland. And even today, the Irish population has never recovered. Today, the Irish population is about six and a half million, so two million less than it was in 1841, which is remarkable and tragic. It's astonishing. It is astonishing. Well, my own ancestors came over in the 1870s, mm. so long after famine. the famine, but for essentially similar reasons, for economic opportunities. Mm. And I think that's the other thing about the famine. We talk about the Great Famine, the Great Hunger of 1845 to 1852. But Ireland suffered many other periods of food shortages afterwards. So 1862, there was a bad harvest and emigration peaked. 1880, a terrible harvest, emigration peaked. So sadly, the Great Famine didn't mark an end to famines in Ireland. And interestingly enough, uh Emigration is still occurring in Ireland now with the so, economic hardships. Yeah, so for a very brief period in the late 90s, early um, of this years of this century, there was a period of economic growth called the Celtic Tiger, but it was short-lived, and since then there's been a real downswing in the economy and great austerity, and people are very depressed. So emigration from Ireland at the moment is even higher than it was during the Great Famine. And again, part of the sadness, it's young people who leave, people who have energy, education, they leave. So what does that do to the people left behind? Mm -hmm. So it's something that, again, it's part of Ireland's really sad history. Well, one of the hopes we have with uh, starting an Irish studies program here is to form some fo uh, stronger bonds between Americans and people in Ireland. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly, we have a sister city, Waterford, Ireland. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's 
wonderful place to visit. There's certainly uh, no, no lack of things to do and uh, people to meet when you go to Ireland. It is the most incredibly beautiful country. It's a very welcoming country. I always think about Ireland despite its sad history, despite its small population. It's a, it's a country with such creativity. If you think how many Nobel Prize winners it's produced, you know, and today it has the wonderful poet Seamus Heaney, and the music is still vibrant. Despite everything, there's a vibrancy and there's a warmth of welcome. So it's just a great place to visit. Well, also a sense of humor, too. Is there's a great <laughs> makes sense of humor. Makes things somewhat bearable. Uh, it's very self-deprecating. <laughs> it's very charming. It's it's yeah, and even the food is good. <laughs> and, and that's true. It's, the, it's, I think the food. I very can good. attest to that. Yes, yeah, and the, the Guinness is great. We say Guinness doesn't travel, but there's nothing like having Guinness within Ireland. Uh, I can attest to that as well. Yes, yes. Well, just uh, we're coming to an end here, but I wonder if you have any reflections on your work on the famine and sort of lessons to be learned from studying this event. I think, and it applies to slavery, that if you marginalize people, dispossess people, and create them in people's minds as the other and different, it's dangerous. Because when a crisis comes, you feel you don't need to go to their help. It's their own fault. So I think, you know, to me, it's an issue of social justice and seeing dignity in everybody and giving them that dignity. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned, too, the idea that initially Many people donated to the victims of the famine, mm. but as it went on, mm. there became something like famine fatigue, absolutely. I guess. Donor fatigue. Donor fatigue, so which you can see today. I absolutely. mean, in a sense, we're besieged by so many crises and mm. so many disasters, uh, yeah. it often becomes overwhelming. It does, and sometimes you say, oh, sure, it's their fault anyway, because you, they're other, they're not us, they're different, and really, they're people, and that's what we should remember. And uh, I, I know you're interested in sort of contemporary organizations dealing with hunger relief mm. and uh, again, learning lessons about how these issues were handled in the past can hopefully be beneficial in what's yeah. done uh, today. Yeah, and you know, Ireland again is known for its generosity to other countries, organizations like Trocra and Concern. Mm -hmm. Ireland, Irish people give one of the highest amounts of donations to overseas famine. So I would like to think that's a legacy of our own history of famine. Yes, and uh, it's, it's why it's often asked, well, why should we dwell on such issues of the past? But uh, partly it's important to know one's own history, but also to have a sense of, well, what, what can we do? Or what, what can we learn from mm -hmm. these horrors and try to, uh, as best we can, avoid them? Yeah, I think prevention is the best thing by giving people agency. There's an Indian historian, Amata Sen, who lived through famine in India in 1943 when it was still part of the British Empire. And he saw food being exported just as our Irish ancestors would have seen food being exported while they starved. And he argues, and I think it's a very interesting point, famine never occurs in a democracy. Well, he's also a great philosopher, so I'm <laughs> glad to have you mention him. Yeah. Uh, and we'll bring this to a close for now, but we would love to have you back. Thank you were you. very well received yesterday. Thank you. And you have a lot of friends here now at uh, St. John Fisher uh, College. And we hope you'll return soon. I hope so. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.